Now, brain attenuation. What is physically happening here? Well, a water droplet consists mostly of fresh water, which has a permittivity that's vastly different than free space. In fact, the epsilon r for at RF for pure distilled water is somewhere around 80, right? So, you know, the, the uh, relative permittivity is 80 times larger than free space. Why is it so high? Because uh, the water molecule is a very polarizable molecule, and it packs very densely in liquid. And so you have a substance that winds up um, having a very high epsilon r, very real, high real value of epsilon r. We don't worry too much about the actual loss through the water. It is significant at RF, but water droplets are so small that you're not really worried about that. The biggest problem comes is because you have an inhomogeneous medium now, you get scattering off the face of the water molecule. And that scattering is going to be highly dependent on the frequency of radiation. So, for example, if I'm operating down in the UHF frequency, let's say less than 3 gigahertz, that means that my wavelength is about, let's see, 3 gigahertz, my wavelength is about, was about 4 inches, something like that. That wavelength is relatively, is pretty large with respect to a, a raindrop. A raindrop is well under a tenth of a wavelength. What does that mean? Well, when the wave passes over the wave drop, the little raindrop, uh, there will be almost no scattering. It just bends right around, kind of goes right on through. It's only when you start to get on the order of about a tenth of a wavelength where you start to see significantly significant scattering. So in that case, as the raindrop gets bigger or the frequency gets higher and the wavelength gets smaller, that raindrop will essentially grab some of the energy out of the wave and then re-radiate it in every direction, not just the forward direction. So essentially, when a wave goes through a rainstorm, little raindrops are picking out and scattering away different bits of uh, power out of the wave. And that's where your attenuation comes from. In a way, we can kind of model it like uh, attenuation in a homogeneous medium, but we have to make some adjustments. And it, it winds up being co a complicated phenomenon, right? Because even if I knew the geometry of the raindrop, that scattering problem with a dielectric sphere is really difficult. There's been volumes written on that and published in transactions about how to physically model that type of problem. Compounding that is the fact that raindrops vary in size, they vary in shape. They're not spheres, it turns out. Uh, they also vary uh, depending on where you are on Earth. At least the rate and the type of storm that you encounter is different. The weather distribution is different. And all of these things factor into our decision as satellite engineers to figure out uh, how to deal with rain in our links. Do we just take the losses on the chin? Do we build in a certain amount of margin in our satellite link? If we build in a certain amount of margin, how much does that translate into outage time? How much link time do we lose during the course of the year? And so by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to answer that question and be able to predict that. So what I'm going to teach to you now is what I like to call the simplified ITU model for rain attenuation. ITU is the uh, International Telecommunications Union. <clears throat> Let me just write out that acronym. You'll probably see it again in satellite in engineering. It's a standardizing body that comes up with standards and recommended practices that govern telecommunications across the world. And they've got a nice model, a basic model, that I've simplified even a little bit more. Online, you can go in and look at the homework. One of the sample homework problems is to actually look at the full-blown ITU 
um, model and this simplified model and see where they differ. It turns out they're only about a dB or two apart unless you get kind of close to the horizon. Uh, the regular ITU model is something that you cannot actually execute on a test in a reasonable amount of time, but this one is, so that's why it looks the way it does. So you can go ahead and take shortcuts and use this one on your test. Um, but rec and it captures the same nuances, the same physical behaviors. It just has a little less complexity to it. Okay. So in this simplified ITU model, and now also I should mention that there have been probably a dozen different models on rain attenuation. Some work in some scenarios better. It's a very complicated phenomenon, so uh, you wind up having to, uh, well, you can spawn all sorts of PhD dissertations looking at this stuff, right? So, of course, there's a bunch of different models competing for the phenomenon. Okay. But they all take roughly the same general form. The basic ITU model looks like this. You have attenuation in dB, so that's total attenuation A. This is equal to a specific attenuation, gamma sub r, This would have units of dBs per kilometer. And then the effective length of the storm. This is, so this is the uh, rain path, the physical distance that your signal must travel through the rainstorm. Of course, that's really just geometry. If you have an altitude, let's say you have an Earth station, and to be consistent with your textbook, let's go ahead and use an H sub S for station. And at some altitude, you have an H sub R prime. This is your rain altitude. And so essentially, you're at this altitude. Your rain has to start at some altitude. Typically, it's a kilometer or so. Whatever it is for your region, you calculate that rain altitude. You subtract your earth station altitude from that, so that gives you this path differential here. And then you need to know what your look angle is. What is your elevation angle? Theta sub L. And so in that case, just using some simple geometry, your effective path length is equal to HR prime minus the altitude of your station divided by the sine of that elevation angle. And remember, elevation angle is measured from the horizon. Okay, so that's the easy part. That's the high school geometry part. The harder part is calculating what that specific attenuation is because it's going to be a function of rain rate. How do you measure rain rate? Well, this in and of itself is kind of an art, it turns out. There are all sorts of different ways to measure rain rate. There's something called a little tipping bucket scale, where it has like a little funnel and a bucket, a little tipping bucket, that when it fills up, it tips. Fills up, tips, it fills up, tips. And the rate of tipping tells you what the rain rate is. Now, the thing about rainstorms is that our model is basically going to assume that it's homogeneous rain from here to here. I put my tipping bucket out, and no matter where I put it in here, I'm going to get the same average rate. That's not even true for most storms, especially that when you get to really high levels of rain rate. First of all, the tipping bucket scale usually can't empty fast enough, and that method of measuring rain rate kind of goes out the window. And secondly, 
you get these things like sheets and cells of rain that move within the storm that can change the attenuation profile and make it highly hom inhomogeneous. So just be aware that most complicated rain models also include terms for trying to track things like, at least statistically, cells and sheets moving through higher levels of rain. So just be aware that those deviations exist in the model that I'm going to give you. Instead, let's just look at the, the basic parts of specific attenuation. Let's see. Gamma sub R, specific attenuation, this was in dBs per kilometer, is equal to some constant K. It is unfortunate that we are reusing constants in this class, but it's for any electrical engineering discipline, it's almost unavoidable, right? There are only so many letters in the, in the uh, alphabet. And even with our pretentious use of Greek, we still run out of letters. So recognize K is not wave number. In this instance, in the literature, it is a constant for fixed frequency and polarization times R, which is your rain rate. Rain rate empirically is measured in millimeters per hour. So when you pick climatological tables out, that's usually the units that that appears in. Convert it to millimeters per hour if you're given something else. And then you raise that to the power alpha. So this, is, again, is another constant for fixed frequency. So if you know your polarization and you know your frequency, all you need to do is pick these two values out of a table. And if you know the rain rate, you'll be able to calculate the specific attenuation for the simplified ITU model. Sounds simple. Well, notice I put for fre fixed frequency and polarization. Why does polarization play a, a role in this? Well, the reason is raindrops. Let's do a little experiment. I'm going to do a little poll in the class. Here's a circular raindrop. Here's an ellipsoidal raindrop. And here's another ellipsoidal raindrop. So if this is down, which of these shapes best represents a raindrop? Let's get a show of hands. How many think it's a circle? Raise your hand. I'm not fooling anybody. Zero. Just like the circle. How many people say it looks like this? Raise your hand. One, two. I only see two. Oh, three. Three. Four. Four. You're, em you're empowering your cop peers. That's four. How many people say it looks like an ellipsoid this way? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14. How many people don't want to answer because you think you're going to embarrass yourself? Raise your hand. No. Well, 4 plus 14 does not equal the attendance of this class right now. It's very suspicious. Okay. Well, if this is a democracy, uh, this one would have won, right? Unfortunately, this is, science is not a democracy, and this is actually the winner. So pat yourselves on the back if you were one of the few in the proud that voted for that one. It looks like this when you look at it. But the thing is, it's moving really quickly through the atmosphere, right? So if you look outside, you see these little streaks of water come down. However, trust me, if you take a slow motion camera and you put it outside and you look, at very high speeds, what's happening, you see drops like this falling down. Why? Because we're dealing with a deformable body. If we were in space, the raindrops would be round because there's no force other than water tension operating on them. As soon as they start to fall, they're deformable bodies. You're going to get gravity pushing down this way, 
and air resistance pushing that. So it's going to squeeze them into this shape as it falls, which is going to fall really fast. So y'all are going to think it looks like this. Understandable mistake. Understandable mistake. Now, if raindrops really look like this, which is the polarization that's going to experience the most loss? Vertical E-field or horizontal E-field moving through the rainstorm? Well, on average, it's going to be horizontal E-field because this looks electromagnetically larger than this dimension. And so you will see that borne out in these statistical surveys of rain attenuation. You will see additional loss when you transmit at horizontal polarization uh, rather than vertical polarization. So let's go ahead. I think I have some tables that I can bring out onto the document viewer. These are out of your textbook. Okay. And let's, oh, perfect. Look at, what a nice image that is. So here's a table of your attenuation coefficients to calculate specific attenuation straight out of your book. You'll see you've got Two sets of Ks, one for horizontal, one for vertical polarization. And two sets of alphas, one for horizontal, one for vertical. In this column, you see frequency. So you've got attenuation coefficients starting all the way down at 4 gigahertz. But look how small they are. My, my advice to you, if you ever get into a situation where you need to calculate a specific attenuation at 4 gigahertz, you should stop doing wireless communications and you should start building an arc. Don't. Don't, do, don't bother with attenuation below 10 gigahertz. We don't care. It never, ha never is a factor. However, look what happens when you get up to 10. Look how many orders of magnitude it changed in just that brief period of time. The reason is, I'll show you the reason on the board in a second. And then it continues to go up, although not quite as dramatically as you get up here into the millimeter wave bands starting at 30 gigahertz and then keep going higher. And then also notice that horizontal is always a little bit lossier than vertical. So for example, here I got 0 0.01. This is 0 0.008 something, if you can make that out. And then likewise, my alphas. All of my alphas are eh, roughly one, but they're slightly different. The horizontal is a little bit larger, meaning it will be a little lossier than the vertical component all the way down. Okay. Now let's see. Let me, I'll go back to the document camera in a second, but I do want to explain that phenomenon because I think it's important to understand. Ah, there's my marker. Why that dramatic increase where it was completely negligible down at 4 gigahertz and then all of a sudden statistically significant, you know, just, you just double the frequency and it becomes significantly higher. Why did it go up so quickly? This gets, it gets into a little bit of radar theory, which hopefully some of you will also practice at some point as an electrical engineers. And in radar theory, you send a wave out and there's an object and it has a radar cross-section, which in, is measured in meters squared. And when the object gets really, really big and it's metallic, then that radar cross-section is kind of approximately equal to its optical cross-section, the visible cross-section of the object. But that's only if the object is many, many wavelengths in dimension. If you were to graph radar cross-section, which is usually given the term sigma RCS in most radar books, as a function of frequency. At high frequencies, when the wavelength was very small with respect to the op object, there's something called the optical limit that this radar cross-section will tend to something measured in meters squared that represents the cross-sectional area of the object. 
Down here, though, at zero frequency, the object at low frequencies doesn't register hardly any scattered signal. And so if you start increasing the frequency, this is roughly the de dependency that any object will follow, not just raindrops, but fighter planes, uh, missiles, um, Superman, whatever's flying in the air. This will be the radar cross-section. This is the characteristic response that all things that reflect electromagnetic energy tend to look like. This region in here is called the Rayleigh region. And it's, it's kind of uh, famous for its extraordinary frequency dependence down here. I think it's like F to the fourth for most objects. So I double the frequency. I multiply by a factor of 16 its radar cross-section. This is when you're starting electromagnetically small, but you're in a region where you're growing and you dramatically increase the radar cross-section. Then you get into a region up here called the Mie region. This is a pain to work with electromagnetically because you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes you get really constructive interference. Sometimes you get really destructive interference. You kind of got to do some intense electromagnetic modeling. It, it oscillates all over the place. And then over here you have the optical limit or the high frequency limit where things tend to settle down along a single radar cross-section value. So sketch that in your notes and put it in your back pocket. You may see it again in some radically different type of electrical problem later on in life. Our raindrops are mostly operating down in this region, which is why you see that strong initial dependence on frequency. Okay. Now, back to the document camera here. So now we know how to calculate specific attenuation if we are given rain rate and frequency and polarization. Now, the problem is rain rate is somewhat statistical. Here's a, a picture on the document camera of rain rate probability exceedance curves, actually, when here we've got logarithmic percentage of time rain rate is exceeded. So to read this graph, you go over to the rain rate, you say, up oh, 100 millimeters per hour. How often did I exceed this rain rate? And this data is actually for three years, 1979, 1980, 1981. Where's the location? Blacksburg, Virginia, my alma mater. Why did they put the college in Blacksburg, Virginia, in the middle of nowhere? Does anyone know why? Evan, do you know why? Cheap land. Cheap land. True. <laughs> that was a happy side effect. It also, I think, is the highest rain rate in the state of Virginia. So if you have an agricultural and mechanical college, that's the place to put it because your crops are going to get watered the most. This is why Blacksburg has the unhappy nickname of Bleaksburg sometimes because the weather can be a little bit gray occasionally. But anyway, it's a great place to do satellite rain experiments. We had some fantastic professors down there that did made a career. Like uh, you're the author of your book, Tim Pratt, uh, did some great work and characterized it extremely well. And this goes to show you, it shows you two things. First of all, if you tabulate rain statistics from year to year, you're going to get different values, right? Weather is weather. It's going to change. However, there are some obvious trends and patterns that follow over time. These curves aren't that radically different from one another, right? If I get up to 100 millimeters per hour, I see that for the, I almost get the, the same order of magnitude value for all three years. And of course, the squared line is the average of the three years. So that would be this line right here. It kind of goes through all of them. So for a given region, we get about the same rain rate from year to year. It's relatively predictable, climate change and weather notwithstanding, right? Now, the ITU has gone through 
and made a map of the globe. Here I'm just showing the Americas here. And have classified the rain distributions of different areas that are similar. And they, give, they assign them a letter. So, for example, here in Atlanta, we are in, I don't think you can read it because I've got marker on it. It's an M. It's an M. M is Georgia. It's a relatively wet place with frequent thunderstorms. Not quite as bad as N, which is Florida. That's in the tropics. And then, you know, if you go up to the northeast, you're in a K, which is a little bit less rainfall, still temperate, and a pretty wide distribution of, of rain rates in millimeters per hour. If you go over to, like, the B, B would be relatively arid. E is the desert here. You've got kind of the desert and the dry areas of the country, the Rockies. D is the Pacific Northwest kind of climate. And, of course, we, we always joke about how much rain they get, but it's a very different distribution than rain in the East Coast, right? It's a lot more frequent, but the millimeters per hour is pushed very low. They don't get a lot of thunderstorms in that part of the country. And so that's all reflected in the way that these areas have been grouped. Again, if you want to look at it in this, this way, we have uh, rainfall exceedance contours. So how often do you, you know, it doesn't even say on the actual graph, but there's a certain threshold percentage, and this is how often you exceed those contours, that percentage of the time. So if we know what the, the letter is, from the ITU climatological cl classification, we can pull out the rain rate intensities. So, for example, here's all the climatological letters. M is Atlanta, remember. And then from this table, we say, what percentage of the time do we exceed the rain, a rain rate? And so if I wanted to say, okay, I am going to design my satellite system to be operated 99.9% .9 of the time. At 0.1% exceedance, what is my rain rate? Well, I look over and I find 22 millimeters per hour. 99.9% .9 of the time, it is raining less than 22 millimeters per hour. It's usually raining nothing, but that's the worst as it, that it gets 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time. So what I do, I take that 22 millimeters per hour, I look up my coefficients for my satellite link, K and alpha, and I calculate what's the specific rain rate, what's the typical storm length. It's usually about a kilometer or two. Then I plug that in, and I get an attenuation factor that tells me how much margin I have to add to my satellite link. So that's the common way to use these tables. If you want a more reliable link, then you have to go down. And a lot of times if, you, if your boss gives you a percentage spec to meet and it's not on the table, then you just do some interpolation. That gets you pretty close on all these. Right. So one time I, I actually asked this question for homework uh, in this class. I gave the students an assignment where... They had to, <clears throat> it's a great, great assignment because it, it blends aperture antennas and rain loss, right? I said, down in Florida, you can go down to Florida and they advertise these rain-resistant antennas. They're basically direct TV antennas that are slightly larger, about 33% larger. They'll charge you an extra 100 bucks and they say, this will give you more viewing time in the state of Florida than it does uh, these cheap knockoff circular direct TV dishes that you can buy. As so I have the students go and calculate exactly how many minutes on average in Florida will that 33% extra aperture buy you in terms of watching time uh, for, for uh, a link in Florida. And it was something silly like a half an hour. And that's during the course of an entire year. Is it worth it? Well, if that half an hour is the Super Bowl, but probably not, but probably not. Okay. Are there any questions about rain attenuation so far?
burning desires, burning questions about the attenuation effects of rain. None? You're all rain experts now? Is this material on the test? You know the answer to that question. Yes? Indication done on the water for like sunburns is a lower frequency. Ah, yes, yeah, that's extremely low frequency. You can't get anything above a few hundred kilohertz in any appreciable depth in salt water. Salt water is the worst propagation environment on Earth. <laughs> a lot of those frequencies, you can't even make the low loss approximation that we did on the board. You actually have to calculate alpha. Good question. Now, some of these rain effects you have to actually have to worry about in uh, terrestrial communications as well. Remember, a lot of people are talking nowadays, there's kind of a buzz about using things like millimeter waves for personal communications, actually equipping your cell phone with a, a device that would send and receive millimeter waves, using arrays to target or to send that energy. And actually, people are attracted to that because of attenuation at these higher frequencies, right? 60 gigahertz, I think at standard temperature and pressure, you get something like 8 or 10 dBs per kilometer on top of whatever propagation losses you experience on the ground. Well, what that means is that you can reuse your frequencies more aggressively because you get all this extra attenuation of potential interferers. And so there's a big push to consider the use for that in 5G communication cellular. Maybe you'll see it in 5 or 10 years down the line. Who knows? Uh, but one of the issues with a system like that is that if it's an outdoor system, if you get a heavy rainstorm, now we're in a regime where there's a significant amount of attenuation per meter up at 60 gigahertz or 30 gigahertz, 28, whatever frequency that they're considering for that. Um, oh, yeah. What about the, the snow and the ice? The ah, ice? snow. So snow, strange to say, when you crystallize water, ice in general is almost translucent to RF at the typical distances you encounter ice. So there, that's a really good question. I have met very few people that worry about snow attenuation. You never have to worry about it in terms of the radio signal. The only time I hear people complain about snow and satellite communications is that the the dish antenna when it gets covered in snow so you got a focus here you got this ideal paraboloid structure that's supposed to focus energy there if you get a lot of snow on your dish the snow itself does not attenuate that much but it does have a permittivity greater than 1 not, not significantly greater than one, not like liquid water, but it is, it's going to cause a reflection at the interface of the snow. So if you have snow and ice on your dish that builds up, then it changes the focal point, and you can start losing power that way. So you've got to go off and brush your dish, dish off in the snow every so often during the snowstorm to maintain communications. That's the only effect that I know about snow and satellite communications. It's very benign to RF. Ice and snow. Good question. In terrestrial communications, we still have to worry about uh, rain attenuation. I uh, had some friends once that was wor were working on a millimeter wave point-to-point -point technology for uh, communications. It was all terrestrial based, but it was kind of very similar to a satellite link. We're using dishes to transmit and receive across town a high data rate link at millimeter waves. So you had dish here, dish here. And this is used for a lot of different things. You can see this type of link used in what they call backhaul. So for example, you have a cellular tower. It's got several sectors worth, and the sectors are each serving a dozen or so users in the mobile environment. There's all this data coming into and out of those users, voice traffic, data traffic, et cetera. How do you get it to the phone company? Well, sometimes you just pull a fiber optic cable to the base station and plug it right into your um, telephone network. 
But if you're in, in an area that doesn't really allow that, sometimes you can establish a, a microwave or millimeter wave link to another tower or another place in town where then you can convert it back into the optical or electrical link to send it into the public switch telephone network or the internet. So that's what, what uh, a lot of these things are used for. In fact, I think you can even see some of these around town in downtown Atlanta. They actually use what I presume are lower rate millimeter wave or high frequency microwave links to synchronize the traffic lights. So that, has anybody seen those little dishes that they put on the traffic lights in downtown Atlanta? Yeah. So now you know how to jam them. And calculate how to take them out with your link budget. Desynchronize the lights. So anyway, I had some friends that were working on this type of technology. This was like 15, 20 years ago before it was really cool. A uh, millimeter wave company down in Florida that I think went belly up eventually. But they had this technology where they would adaptively transmit, alter the transmit power uh, depending on what the rain rate, rate was. So if a rainstorm moved in, you'd crank up the power so that you'd maintain an acceptable signal-to-noise ratio at your receiver here. And so one time they had a very interesting problem where a big rainstorm would come in and basically would pass in, would try to do adjustments. Sometimes it would be so much rain that they couldn't even transmit enough power. And when the rainstorm rain, uh, moved away, and the sun came out again, the link wouldn't work. The link wouldn't work. They couldn't figure out. Everything checked out fine. It was really interesting. So they had this closed-loop feedback control, right, where you're basically saying if, if your signal-to-noise ratio starts dropping, increase the transmit power. And after several rounds of increasing the transmit power, it turns out that the engineer that designed the transmitter here didn't put a uh, very good power amplifier on the system. And that power amplifier started to saturate. And I don't know if you're familiar with power amplifiers, but when power amplifiers start to saturate, that means that they start transmitting power in outside bands. They start clipping, and you start dumping a lot of your transmit power into frequencies that are not your center frequency. And so what was happening, the storm was coming in. It was maxing out the transmit power. It was going so nonlinear that the power was being dumped into all these other bands. And then when the storm moved away, there was so little power left in the principal harmonic that this was still, the receiver was still giving power requests. It's like, up your power. I don't have enough signal-to-noise ratio. So it's okay. I'll make it transmit more nonlinear. Of course, that just dumped more of the power into these higher bands. And you were locked in this cycle that could not correct itself until you just powered down the system and turned it back on again. So that was kind of an interesting RF uh, rain teaser, or rain teaser, as I like to call them. Rain teasers are, are, are notorious in uh, communications. I remember one of my, one of my colleagues in, in uh, grad school, his name was Hao Shu. He did some really great work in millimeter waves and he measured some point-to-point -point links, and he was doing some channel sounding. And so he had, I think it was a 60-gig link set up across campus one time. And it was line of sight. You know, there were no buildings in the way. And he was measuring how it would be affected as rain came in and out of the college during the course of a three- or four-month period. And he's one of the luckiest guys I know because during the period he had his system on, we got this freak hail storm. It was like, you know, almost golf ball size here. There was probably a tornado somewhere. And it was just dumping all this rain. And he was measuring the link. He was measuring the radio echoes in the channel. So basically at his receiver, it's a fairly uncluttered environment. So you get a really high peak if you're measuring the channel power as a function of delay. And as the rainstorms would come, this peak would change amplitude and fluctuate. Why would it fluctuate? Why would it f fluctuate in time as a rainstorm was happening? Well, the average power is always attenuated. However, those little droplets are scattering diffuse power forward in the link. They're actually diff 
scattering it in every direction, but they're also scattering lots of diffuse components towards the receiver. And those will constructively and destructively interfere. You'll actually get, if anybody's familiar with mobile communications, you'll get a form of Ricean fading on most rain links like that. And he was observing that at the time. In other words, the, this was starting to drop in average, but there was also be, be a, like a wiggle around that average as the rain rate maintained. And sometimes he would see reflections like that. Well, the interesting thing is this big superstorm that passed through really attenuated this. It got down to here, wiggled around. And then when the storm passed, the sunshine, the sunshine came up, and it still stayed low, like uh, around that level. And then over the course of the next few hours, it went back up to its original peak. What was happening? Anybody care to guess that scenario? Well, one of the things we realized is that there was a lot of buildings in between here. And most university buildings have like gravel roofs, right? And with, at, at millimeter waves, they just kind of spray energy everywhere. However, if you get a big puddle on a gravel roof, you wind up making a really nice reflective surface. And a reflective surface is a double-edged sword in electromagnetics because it can reflect an extra amount of power to a location. But if that field is out of phase, it will add destructively and cause a drop in the power. Then as the puddle drains and evaporates off, you'll slowly destroy that destructive interference and you'll recover your original component. So rain is a peculiar, peculiar thing. Water is a strange thing. You always have to be on the lookout for what it does to a communications link.